Welcome everybody. Thanks everybody for, for coming out today. We have an awesome crowd, a, a full house today, which I'm really pleased to see. Uh, I'm Nick Fisichelli. I'm the interim president and CEO with Scooting Institute at Acadia National Park. And uh, welcome to our, our Thursday, our monthly Thursday brown bag lunch series. Uh, Scudic Institute, we are a research and learning organization. We work in, in very close partnership with the National Park Service and in, in running this, this research learning center. And, and our focus is really on, is on environmental change and, and the future. And so it's understanding environmental change and the consequences of, of those changes. And then it's uh, developing conservation solutions to the changes that are happening. And the third thing is engaging people in, in this work, in the scientific discoveries and the creation of solutions to the challenges. And, and really the, the, the goal is to really create a, a, a better future uh, for parks and for people. So for Acadia National Park, the local communities, and, and, and uh, in the region and, and beyond as, as well. So thank you guys so much for, again, for, for coming out today. Uh, our, our talk, to, and, and I have, and I'll pass out just um, uh, a sign-up sheet for our newsletter. We do an e-news that comes out monthly, uh, so you can keep up to date on the happenings here, as well as the uh, various lectures uh, that we have and um, brown bag talks. And let's see, later this month we have uh, in, in uh, uh, we have some night sky events happening here on campus. Uh, there's the, the night sky celebration in, in Acadia at the end of the month. So check out our website, scooticinstitute.org, for more information on uh, those night sky events later this month. And finally, uh, next October 8th, I believe it is, it's a Tuesday evening, our next lecture is on clouds. And, and from an, an individual from the Cloud Appreciation Society, sort of on the, on the wonder of clouds. So I definitely encourage you to come back out uh, Tuesday, October 8th for, for that lecture. And before I, before I forget, uh, the, the talk is being uh, uh, recorded today, videotaped today. Um, so I just want to make sure you guys all know that. And, and so um, uh, if you have questions, just speak up so that we can ca capture that in, in the microphone. I'm also told to tell you guys to keep the profanity to a minimum as well. <laughs> so, although this was a Navy base, we don't have to use sailor talk here. Um, so, so, that, uh, so we are videotaping this. And so for anybody of your friends who wasn't able to come today, they'll be able to see uh, this talk on our YouTube channel, the Scudic Institute. Uh, YouTube channel. Of course, they won't get the wonderful cookies that you all have gotten to, to have here by coming in person. So people watching online are definitely going to be missing out on the cookies. Uh, so without further ado, you're going to hear from, hear from Dale Woodward, who worked at uh, here when this was a Navy base. And he worked here from 1974 until the closing in 2002. And, share a lot about the history and I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn more about about this place so thanks for coming out Dale. thank you and thank you folks for coming and this is very informal I'm as well as laid back a person this is fine can you hear me all right up there if you can't hear me yes give me one of those like that well uh, I was born in the area I was born in the village of Korea so the road here the ways. And so the base was here when I was born, believe it or not. And and, uh, and it was just just here. And you know, we would see the the gray vehicles driving around now and then. But uh, early on when the base was established everything was here. And uh, I never interacted with uh, any of the military families until I went to high school at some high school. But uh, it was a good run for the, for the base. But in the beginning, back in 1880, John G. Moore began purchasing land here on Scudic Peninsula. And I 
I'm going to show you where we are. This is new technology to me, so uh, bear with me. Okay. So this is uh, an overhead of the skirt. I don't want to have a look at it. Maybe if I turned it around, it's probably what Okay. We are out here. This is the town of Winter Harbor. And this is the Korea Peninsula over here. So, anyhow, in 1880, John G. Moore started purchasing land here on Skudik Peninsula and constructed a road to Skudik Head. By the way, the elevation of Skudik Head is 437 feet. So you get a good view of the surrounding territory here. But over on Mount Desert back in, in 1916, the Sertamont National Monument was established on the island. In 1919, it was reestablished as Lafayette National Park. And in 1929, it was renamed Acadia National Park. And the Department of the Interior accepted 1,500 acres on Skudik Point, which included Skudik Head and Big Moose Island, which we're on here that was donated by the daughters of John G. Moore. <clears throat> in 1903, the Navy established its first radio shore station, and by 1908 was operating chains of stations up and down the Atlantic and Pacific coast. And we fast forward to 1917. 1917, Alonso Fabre, a summer resident on MDI was an enthusiastic experimenter of wireless telegraphy, held both an amateur radio license, operator's license, and a station license. And the U.S. Navy had no stations at this time with the capability of providing continuous, reliable service, wished to improve transatlantic communications under an agreement that would appear unusual today, Fabry agreed to build a radio station in exchange for a naval commission. He was commissioned in June of 1917 and US, radio na US Naval Radio Station Otter Cliff went into operation on August 28th of that year. On the cliff is over on Mount Zara. <clears throat> it soon provided a proof to, to uh, possess phenomenal receiving range and as a result became the Navy's chief transatlantic receiving station during World War I. In 1919, February relinquished his commission and returned to civilian life, and he was awarded the Navy Cross in 1920. And fast forward to 1932. John D. Rockefeller wanted Otter Cliff for the National Park Scenic Loop Road. Loop Road. After some negotiations, the Navy agreed to vacate, vacate Otter Cliff at the equally suitable site to be found within a 50-mile radius. Such a site was identified on Big Moose Island, on Skillet Point. The National Park Service agreed to set aside 25 acres for the new radio station. And Rockefeller strongly urged the Park Service to employ the services of a New York architect, Robeson, Atterbury for the design of the first five new Navy buildings. One of Atterbury's first clients on MDI was Ernestino Fabre, who was the brother of Aranzo Fabre. Now, I'm forgetting what I'm doing here. I'll give you some pictures here. <laughs> this was the Otter Cliff Tower and some of their up to date equipment. <laughs> okay. This is the uh, construction of the uh, Rockefeller building, building one. 
and uh, it employed uh, a lot of masons uh, to do that job. And this aerial photo here actually was taken probably in the early 50s, but this is a Rockefeller building here. On either side of it is a 220-foot uh, tower. And, I, and there was uh, like a single wire that break between those two. And that was the sending and receiving. And these are all points of huts that served as barracks, galleys. So uh, this was a galley here at one time. And uh, building 10 yet they did it. So. In 1935, the U.S. Naval Radio Station Winter Harbor was formally commissioned on February 28th. Chief Radioman Max Ginn was the officer in charge with 11 personnel assigned to his command. The five buildings that were built originally were the apartment building, the Rockwell building, powerhouse, Communications Receiving Building, which is Building 3 over here, uh, a Direction Finding Building, and a Pump House, and the pair of 210 steel towers. Drinking water was provided by deep wells, <coughs> and the sewage went directly into the ocean. <laughs> by 1942, Building 10 was built, and Building 10 was the, not only the admin building, but it, it served as barracks, it had uh, like a PX in it, uh, the medical department, such as it was, was there, and the building now, they, <coughs> this has been taken down. And that is, in 1947, as the Navy's mission grew, an additional 52 acres, and eventually all of Big Moose Island, west of the road, was acquired. And the Navy cleared land and erected several lombic antennas that consisted of 90-foot wooden poles. And if you look real high, right there, it looks like a tree, but that's, that's part of those these rhombic rays, if you look at the footprint, I mean, the shape of a rhombic. And when I was uh, a kid, my dad ran a side ink carrier for Stinson Canning Company for like 35 years. And I would go with him every time I had the opportunity, especially if a short trip. Short trip was like in, in the area, Brookfield and Bar Harbor or, or uh, Millbridge going the other way. And anyhow, when we sailed out by here, the, they had cut all the tall trees down on the island, and all there were was these 90-foot poles sticking out. It looked like a pincushion, this island. And uh, I had, uh, I've got to talk about my job a little bit to get into this. I came to work here in uh, the fall of 72 as an antenna mechanic at the career site. And, uh, a few, weeks, a few years later, I was promoted to the maintenance control director, and I was responsible for assigning all the work and identifying work and getting work done. And I, my direct boss was a public works officer, and they had an assistant public works officer, which was also a Navy, usually a chief or a JG or, or something like that. There were one rhombic array left when I came to work here, and the uh, ham operators used it for their program. And the public works officer and I went out, and it was down back of this area over here, and uh, he and I, with a, just a, a wrench, because there were only like three sets of guys, actually fell the last uh, pole that was up there. That's my claim to fame there. <laughs> but uh, uh, as time went on, I was promoted. The Navy had a, a 
they wanted more continuity in the public works and they made the assistant public works office uh, billet a civilian so I moved into that and as time evolves and the, the word get out the base was closing uh, they didn't assign another Navy public works officer they pushed me into that spot. so I was the public works officer I actually locked the late the, the gate the day that we closed. So we'll move on here. And I'm free to ask any questions, folks. This, this, this was uh, up where the ball field is now. This was actually a, a, a and Something to do. I don't know what the what the function was, but it was part of the system. And the building that sat on the ball field. They're looking on the north and the west there. So nineteen fifty one, the Navy acquired four hundred and fifty acres in the heath of Korea and constructed building forty and forty one. You see the road goes along into Korea. Right by the road is still a building there. That's building 41. Building 40 was at that site there. And there were two antenna arrays out here. And then later, they constructed, uh, they put another 40, the 90-foot pole rhombic array sites. That's in the early 50s. I was a, I started lobster fishing when I was seven years old. <laughs> And I was actually uh, down in here on the, this is Prospect Harbor Bay, if you will, when the helicopters were coming over to take photographs of this area back in like 1950, before they bought off. All right, 1952, New construction included on the base here, commissary, which was right where this building is sets today. Generated building over here. The Quonset huts that we saw in the previous photo. And additions to the communication building, which was building three. In 1958, the name was changed to Navy Security Group Activity Winter Harbor. In 1959, joint numbers of personnel in Navy acquired uh, in the Navy acquired land and constructed 20 Cape Cod houses in the town of Guanahara. So, and they were known as Cape Out. Cape Out was actually uh, a senator's name that sponsored the bill to provide the funds. I believe. So, And later on, 1960, 15 duplex units were added. Ocean Heights, Harbor View and Ocean Heights. 1960, construction continued as the population grew of the, of the base. They added the gym, the galley, the barracks, trap station, firehouse, water tower, picnic shelters, public toilets, and a well was drilled on Scudic Head, and the water actually is piped underneath the uh, West Pond, over there, West Pond Coal. Uh, back to Korea. You're looking uh, west, which crossed that point, and that's Scudic Head, way over on the. Right there. Building 85. And the Wallen Weber Circularly Disposed Antenna Array was constructed in Korea. The steel structures that you see here, these tall things, that, that ring there, there's 50 90 foot towers, and outside of them is, and that's actually a reflective screen. Outside of them, there's another 24 foot towers out here. 
And so there's 50 antennas with that association, and I think there's 120 for the other, the other deal. And this has all had a ground mat. It had uh, wires and <coughs> radio wires, and so the, the, the theory is, I guess, if uh, a, a, a radio waves come in and they bounce off the screen and they reflect back on the antenna. And each antenna, and this is true of the 90 foot, all the towers they had, is a single wire about an eighth inch in diameter that went from the antenna to the end of the building to the, the equipment. This is IG85 uh, armored cable. This was made to go anywhere unless you pass that around. All for this one eighth inch. Why? So when, when the base was, uh, as, as we started to environmentally clean up things, there was miles, miles of that stuff that we had to remove. And we got to do a interesting job. All right. This is an interrupted, uninterrupted power source. I want to say it's mechanical, electrical. Uh, this electricity ran the, ran all the equipment, so they couldn't have any break in there, uh, sending or receiving or whatever. So the way this is designed is, this is a big flywheel, and it's electric motors, two electric motors drives this thing and if the power goes out this is still spinning and it gives they have diesel ja uh, diesel generator backup it gave it enough time to uh, the diesels to come on to provide the uh, emergency power now as things evolve this all went to electronics and a battery bank this, this was the early electric uh, power. In 1963, 1962, uh, 1960 through 62, we're, we're, the, we're building the buildings in Korea and the antenna systems. In 1963, all the operations were transferred to the Korea site. New construction on Skudik uh, <coughs> continued through the 70s with a the schooner club, medical and dental building, bowling alley, theater, gas stations, wastewater treatment plant, and the gymnasium, which has since been removed. That's the gym. This is the an aerial shot of the, the base from the east. This is the Rockefeller building. This was the barracks. Actually, there was another piece as big as that right here. This is uh, Skoda housing that still exists here on the base. That was your water tower. The gymnasium was here. This is actually the commissary where we are now. That's the public works building over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's the whole building. That's one half. That's the other. Mm -hmm. What year was that in? This would be taken in uh, the 80s, this, this photo here. This was like the, as big as we got. This was the final, the final plot here. Yeah. This is what the park service got when we closed, the, closed up in uh, 02. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Yeah. They're also in town in uh, 1982. Uh, they built, this is behind the food service. Food services here in Winnehaba. This is where the condos are now. Mm -hmm. 
this was the original site. Now there's a road on the back side. That was a townhouses there. And at the career site again, in 1970, they started the Classic Wizard program. And this had to do with ray domes and satellites and all kinds of stuff. But this was the original building here. And that eventually got twice as long, twice as wide, and like a half wide again, it was like a, uh, two acres, uh, like an acre square before they were through it. And, and the system of four, four radar. This doesn't show up too well, but this is just on Scooter Point. Every building, every facility had a number. We, we start one, this was the Rockefeller building, the generator building, the chapel, and so on and so forth. This got 228. So there was, over the year, 228 facilities or, or things. The last one was a portable water treatment plant, which was built in 1996. talking about personnel and it said the 1990 census the town of Winter Harbor included 754 Navy personnel because this was family members as well and this represents the, the officers in their rank at the time and so actual military people, that was 300 and 308 people. Anyway, let me back up here a little bit. In town, also, also on the base here, you know, we uh, talked about the Skillet Housing, we built 32 buildings, 32 apartments there in the 70s, 1980. <coughs> and over the street here, this big building here, this is the Public Works building that was built in the 80s. One of the, pro one of the uh, enjoyment things about my job is I, I was responsible for new construction. So if uh, we needed a, a facility or, or a modification to the facility, I would sketch up uh, a floor plan and present it to the engineers and architects who would expand on that. So the Public Works building you know, was of course one of my latest last uh, creations and, and uh, I wound up with a corner office <laughs> with a view of uh, the Cadillac Mountain. Uh, as time went on we uh, the, the uh, Missions changed in the world, and then this is uh, 1998. Uh, the CDAA, which is the career site, was disestablished, mm -hmm. and in 2002, we turned the base over to the Park Service, mm -hmm. and that was the demise of, of the base. But, the military, the majority of people here were uh, communication uh, experts, and they were a different uh, different breed of individuals. Uh, they, they, uh, very, most of them uh, very intelligent guys and uh, uh, cut above. The, the, I was fortunate to have a new boss every two years. My, I'd say I had a Navy, usually as Navy lieutenant, they were all engineers. They were, some of them were JGs, some one was a lieutenant commander. They were certainly uh, uh, people that were gonna go someplace, you could just tell. And the, and the COs were remarkable, I mean, uh, one of, the, one of the next to last CEO, Admiral Rogers, was 
You've seen him on TV the past year or so. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, when I was in high school, there were a few uh, military uh, kids that went to high school with me. I can remember one night uh, uh, bringing a guy home. He lived right in Building One. This is apartment buildings in Building One. And he come up to the gate and he says, don't bother to stop. So I didn't stop on the way in, but I got stopped on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> like one thing when we were teenagers, we would, not as good a point, you had to, you could, because all the was was AM stations then, but you could pick up over a hundred AM stations on the car radio. That's good a point. We used to listen to Wheel in West Virginia, uh, Ticonderoga, New York. Uh, growing up in Korea, uh, in the morning, we, the radio was on, and my mother had tuned in Carl Vassoos on WBZ, 1030 bus. And, and I still listen to it today. <laughs> so. so, folks, are there any Navy personnel here that was stationed here? The last time I gave this talk, I had a couple, so that they, they really added. I have a friend who was here in 1959, and he said he got off a Greyhound bus at Tuttle's store, which is the end of uh, 186 and Route 1, and uh, he said it was snowing, and the lights were still on the store, and of course the locals used to go to the store after supper and chew the fat, and he went in and he said, uh, is there a radio station, is there a Navy base around here? And they said, <laughs> No, no, not around here. But, uh, there was a payphone there, and he went out and made a phone call, and somebody had to come up to get him. And it was quite one of the public works officers that I had. He said they were just so excited to get here because they knew it was in the middle of nowhere. And, and because other folks, it's the other way around. The further they get from Bangor, the ner more nervous they get. <laughs> but, like that. So, so do you folks have any questions <clears throat> you'd like to ask? So, okay, sir. <clears throat> uh, the Korea facility, oh, five, six, seven years ago, they were planning on putting in a, I think, salmon or uh, some of the tuna uh, aquaculture facilities. That, fell through? I really don't know what the status of that is. I know uh, the land was turned over to the University of Maine at one time and, and other facilities. But that, that was part of the program. Because right? the bulk of the land over there went to the uh, Fish and Wildlife. So, but the developed land uh, went to the University, I think, and then they did something with it. I, I don't know what the status is. Yeah. Yeah, I, this gentleman over here, please. The, uh, the Navy group in Cutler? And, yes. In Birch Harbor, Prospect Harbor there, mm -hmm. are they connected to the security group? Or were they? <coughs> no, they weren't. Uh, the, both of them are two separate commands. Uh, Cutler, which has real towers, but that tower is uh, some of them are almost a thousand feet high down there. Uh, they, their, their purpose was, uh, and still is, is to communicate with submarines. Very low frequency uh, operation. The Dead A in Prospect Harbor is a separate entity. I was trying to think what their, their home base out of Fort Wyoming, uh, California. Anyhow, they originally were at seawall over on over at the, on the Coast Guard's property at Bass Harbor and they came over here in maybe 57 and we used to, we used to uh, uh, provide them services uh, maintenance and housing and, and uh, they, they ate their meals here they actually delivered meals to them uh, as well is sort of Chris, I think, always had lunch wagons running back and forth. So, so. 
What, what is their function now? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, unofficially, they, they uh, do housekeeping on satellites. Satellites wow. have to maintain certain orbits, certain temperatures, certain other things. And, and they, that's one of the functions. Yes, I have a small couple. Yes, ma'am. Shortage of housing in Maine in general. I'm, I'm not sure about this area, but I wonder what happened to all those. The housing? And houses. The housing in Winter Harbor, because all the housing was in Winter Harbor except what was on the base here. Everything on the base went to the park service. The housing in Winter Harbor, uh, there was a corporation, uh, Mr. Dixon. Uh, put together a corporation to dispose of the housing for the town of Winter Harbor. It went to the town of Winter Harbor. He had a, uh, a corporation that actually sold it off, proved it, whatever needed to be done. So Winter Harbor got, got a good deal out of it. But it's being reused, that's all I have to Yep, was there somebody else? Yes, sir. What was, do you know what the range? was on, on the site over in Korea, how far out could they transmit and receive? Well, they could actually talk to themselves around the world. I mean, they say you could, even with like a teletype, you could dip, dip, and, and, and in a millisecond, it would come back and get, get your own to see. So, uh, talking to, I never knew what really went on. Because it was top secret stuff even though I had a clearance, but I didn't have the need to know. But, uh, and they had different missions they were doing, but they would, they were surveillance, just listening to any airway, anything that was going on. I, I had a fellow who used to work for me that was a former retired uh, military, and he was stationed at Korea, and he was telling me he was listening to a aircraft that was going down. It was a commercial mm -hmm. aircraft. And, and how nonchalant the, the pilot was, who, talking about, you know, the, uh, this is this is the end of the trip, you know, but uh, we, we crash landed and it was just, you know, doing his job right to the end. Yes, sir. Uh, could you, uh, do you know anything about the evolution of the road into the Navy base? I mean, um, we hear that, uh, you know, during the Navy base time there were fatalities prior to it becoming a one-way and all that sort of stuff and then it was it went yes. from a two-way to a one-way do you know any of that yeah that yes unfortunately uh, there, there were I mean there were several fatalities both military and civilian on, on the roadway and uh, I'm try, trying to recall when it I it used to be because it used to be two-way and in the winter time, they would they would shut off the east side, if you will, and just plow this side. But when I came to work here in '74, and it was one way then, so sometime before that. But uh, yeah, some of the last fatalities. There was three young people killed over from Millbridge, killed on uh, an accident by Blueberry Hill right there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, Going to school when I was uh, was riding the bus to school, especially on a snowy morning, you look and, and now and then, because we'd ride the, what I call a palm road, one, one uh, ninety-five. Yeah, you'd see a navy, you know, you know it was a navy personnel. There'd be a car way off in the snow somewhere. They, they had trouble with that stuff. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Up at Schooner Commons, there's a, a couple of pictures in the lounge. One is of a, of a young man with his, in his uniform, with his bed, his cot, and his, you know, up, upright um, like, uh, locker. And there's another photo of a submarine, and I'm wondering if that submarine was sighted off the point here, if you happen to know. I, I don't. I can remember when they thought they saw a submarine. <laughs> uh, when I was, uh, again, when I was uh, probably 10 years old, they used to transport oil by small uh, tankers. And uh, in the Millbridge, one place, they, they actually went up the river and they did river had a couple tanks there. 
and uh, they set very low in the water, especially when they were loaded. And if you looked at one from a distance, it appeared that you were looking at the conning tower of a submarine. And I think that that got reported a few times. <laughs> yes, sir. They did have a submarine come in during the lobster festival one year. They did. They yes, I remember that. Vessels that would come in every year. Yeah. What? Plenty of deep water over there, like that. Yeah, this, if you look at Maine history, there's all sorts of <coughs> submarine stories, even on the coast here. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you a quick submarine story. I had, uh, I volunteered, my wife and I volunteer at the Ellsworth Hospital. Uh, she does it year round, two days a week. I do it in the wintertime, because I go lobster fishing in the, in the summer and fall. My daughter's taking my place today. Anyhow. Uh, this guy told me the story that uh, he was talking to, um, to a former U-boat uh, captain, and he was he was in uh, a D-Day. Uh, in D-Day, he said, "I had no no to no fuel, no had no fuel, no armament, no torpedoes or anything, uh, like a, a teenage crew on a submarine." But he was ordered to go to do what he could do to disrupt D-Day, and he got he got uh, uh, forced to the surface and uh, by a British uh, vessel, and the British uh, the captain uh, made him turn over his cap. To him. Fast forward to today, the guy said he was in a museum in. Uh, Canada, I want to say Ontario, anyhow. and in a museum in a glass case was that guy's cat. Yeah. <laughs> Same story. But anyhow, but he said he actually surfaced in Narraguegas Bay for repairs, and and he was actually trying to find. There was a house on the shore that he remembered. And he was trying to find that this the captain was. Anything else, folks? Yes. <clears throat> that, uh, up at Jasper Beach, across the road from that entrance, there's a abandoned housing facility and a geodesic dome up at the top. Is that part of Cutler? Uh, that was uh, the Air Force. That was uh, uh, radar, uh, radar installation. Uh, yeah. That's what that was. And now it's it's also Main State Prison. It's quite controversial right now. Yes, sir. Over in Korea, in addition to, uh, you showed the picture of the paved road and the buildings and the yes. reflection array and all that. Right next to it, in the bog, it has a dirt road now going out to it. What is that? That used to have a wire, a circle of wire, right, that blank space on the right. So if you went out that little tiny road there, Okay, this one here. Yeah, there's a big circle yeah. of water. Right. There was, this, there were, I actually worked on this as a, kid, as a teenager. This is, sorry. They, they built it ill. See, this was a low uh, shot antenna array. So you can see it's circular. And there was another one over here. And they rebuilt that when I was in high school. And the winter before, they were putting in these 90-foot poles out there. And my dad worked for them that winter. And during January or February vacation, he got a, he asked them, Raymond Satchin Contractors, which was a contractor out of Ellsworth. And he asked my dad, and my dad asked him, he said, can I bring my son on to, to work? I was 17. And we were put in foundations. And it was cold enough that you could drive like a jeep on the on the permafrost, I mean, because this is all bog you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But and then the permafrost will be about, about a foot deep, because it's all peat till you get to bedrock, and it may be eight feet or maybe twenty eight feet, depending on. And we actually dug out, dug a hole and put in like a four foot sauna tube and filled it full of concrete. And that next summer, I they hired me back, and I worked all summer out there. Yeah, that was the original, yeah. like I uh, say, 1951, the original uh, foundation of that. 
And then, because then this essay is 1960, this was 1970 when they put this one in. This actually is the Korea Cemetery, and we used to call it a ball field when I was a kid, it was a gravel pit here. And these were the radomes, one, two, three, and that was a target antenna. You can see they could all. So the property line actually goes down fairly close this way, and then back under this way. So. And Dale, that's what was called the uh, the elephant elephant fence? cage. Elephant cage. There, there were uh, roughly thirty of those around the world. Uh, I, I've been to several, but uh, the next closest one to us was in is Chesapeake, Virginia. It's straddles Virginia, North Carolina, and then there used to be one in Homestead. That hurricane took that one down. Uh, there was San Diego, there was one in uh, Imperial Beach, uh, San Francisco area, there was one up in Washington State, there was one in uh, Alaska, and then there was several of them overseas. Diego Garcia, there was one. Uh, one in Germany, one in uh, Iceland, Kepler so, Scotland. Hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, the baseball field out here and, and, the, and the tennis court, they used to be used quite quite a bit. The baseball field did. I, I've been walking out here for years and I've never seen anybody play baseball there. Yeah, well, when the, when the military was here, I mean, the baseball was here. And, and that's one thing I have to say about the military. They were very involved in the, in the kids' sports in town because there were more younger kids and most of them went to the Winter Harvest schools. And the and the, uh, the guys were very supportive of of uh, little league and, and that type of thing. So uh, they, cause they used the field out here too to play as well. But <clears throat> yeah, when the military is here, they they're very active in sports. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Was there was there any other issue that Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you had 150 yeah. jobs, uh, some of them <laughs> better, better jobs uh, in the area. Uh, it, it did have a, a, a big impact. Uh, of, uh, it was like 100 full-time employees and you know, up to maybe 50 part-time employees. And uh, the park service only took uh, a handful, four or five, and but everybody had the opportunity. Because a lot of us, I was, I, I had the opportunity to retire or transfer. I, I retired. A lot of people, of course, did retire, and uh, but a lot of people did transfer. Some went to Cutler, some went to Brunswick, some went out of state. Yes, ma'am. I know some of the ladies that, that worked uh, in special services. Still 
Mm. Any other questions, folks? I'll just mention that since talking about you know, Scooter Cars for All was one of the things that, that, that came, and then Scooter Institute as well was one of the newer developments. And so in 2002, when Navy Base closed and all the buildings reverted back to the National Park Service, it took the National Park Service a few years of, of planning, but this became a research learning center of the National Park Service, and there are, are 18 what they call RLCs, research learning centers across the National Park System. Each one is a little different, and this is really the largest campus, the largest research learning center in the, the park system. And, and the original nonprofit, Scudic Institute, was originally called uh, Acadia Partners and was, was formed to manage the, the campus. And, and so over the last 15 years, uh, that's evolved into Scudic Institute. And, and so we still, we continue to, to uh, manage the campus and, and now have a bigger focus on science and education here as, as well. And, and we, we employ, it's about roughly 20, 20 full-time year-round uh, people, and we have about the same number of seasonal employees. And so it's a, it, it is a small number compared to the Navy personnel that were here. But that's, that's been sort of one of the, the developments since the, the Navy base closed. <coughs> oh, the employees of Scudic Institute actually park, national park employees or is it separate? Separate. So we are a nonprofit organization, a 5013C nonprofit, uh, and we work in close partnership with the National Park Service. Uh, but there are also NPS, so federal employees, that are here on campus as well. For example, some of the maintenance staff here on campus are National Park Service and some of the education staff. So there's a mix we share and work together on this campus, the two organizations. Where are you funded? What are you funded through? Uh, good question. What are, what are we funded through? So uh, three, really the three main sources. Uh, one is the operations of, of this campus. Uh, two is through philanthropic support. And the third is through grants that we get from foundations for our, our research and our education work. So those are the, the three main main uh, sources of funding for us. Well, let's uh, give Dale a round of yeah. applause. Thank you very much, Dale, for, for sharing the history here. It's really fascinating what, what's happened here. And anybody has any last minute questions, uh, you can come up and speak with Dale. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy the beautiful weather. Thank you. Very much.